It's January 28th, 2021. This is Rook. Look, if you're searching for souls who are doing admirable work in promoting Persian arts and culture, look no further than our featured guest today. She is a brilliant musician who has taken her cello to concert stages around the world. But more recently, she's parlayed her creative chops into broadcasting as a regular face on Manoto television for years and now Iran International. Maral Mohammadi is the producer and host of the culture show Panjere, and she'll be here for a feature interview, plus another installment of It's All Persian to us and Chef Hoss Zareh with his latest edition of Hospitality. You don't want to miss this one. This is Conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. and Shai were dancing. Hi there. Welcome to episode number 80 of Rok Hashdod. Kian, that means 80. Thank you. Yes. I wasn't aware. <laughs> Hope you are keeping well wherever you are. Tuning in from around the world. Salam Dustan Aziz. Hello, fabulous Kian. Hello, Jean. The fabulous Kian. I'm sorry, yes, the full title. You get it right. We have, we have Maral Mohammadi joining me in just a little bit for our feature interview. I'm, I'm a fan of hers. She is an Iranian in the diaspora who really makes it her mission to bring art, artists, alternative music, interesting creative works done by people of Iranian descent to a wide audience. Really talented musician who's now become uh, known for her broadcasting for years on Manoto and more recently on Iran International. She'll be joining us from London, Shaya Jun. I know you're a fan of hers, a friend of hers. Yes, hi. That is the voice of Groovy Shaya, Shaya from the band Dang Show, <laughs> the minister of all things musical and audio that you hear on Rook. Oh. Thank you. How yes. are you? <laughs> I'm Minister of Propaganda. That's, that's me. Uh, I am I am well. Merci. Khubi. And uh, sitting next to you, uh, I mean, uh, socially distanced, <laughs> is Captain, Captain Reza. For folks who don't know Captain Reza, by the way, he is the captain of nothing he is not <laughs> he has no skills in terms of being a oh, captain hero. but he is the captain of this rook ship <laughs> um <laughs> How are you, Captain I'm Reza? very well, sir. How are uh, you? I am well. I'm looking forward to speaking with Maral. I'm looking forward to this whole program. It is, um, perhaps I'm giddy because we're inside. It is freezing it in is. Toronto it today. Is. I mean, it's really winter at this point. It's you, the depths of hell, as I call it. <laughs> yes, I think hell is supposed to be hot. Though. Well, if, if hell was cold, which I, huh. I, to me, hell is cold. Thank you for yes. that interesting <laughs> commentary. <laughs> you know, I took Oogie out for a walk in the early morning hours. We early morning. And, you know, sometimes I still think it's above zero. Like Toronto weather is not super freezing these days. Maybe it's climate change or something. I, I, thought, I thought I remember as a teenager it was always really cold. Mm. But, you know, recently it feels like it's mild. You know, it's mild. But so one gets fooled into thinking, okay, it's not uh, it's not that cool. So I was just wearing a leather jacket over a t-shirt, uh, and that was uh, badly conceived on a on a day like as cold as today. But then I was thinking about my mom, and I don't know if this is a an Iranian mom thing or just my mom, but I was thinking about what my mom would say if she saw me, and and the the Persian penchant for uh, exaggeration, you know? So she would say, Yani locht rakhti bidu, locht locht, you know? Which, and I was thinking about that, like that's all normal to us, right? Of course, your mom says, bazam locht rakhti. But if you actually, if you translate it, you know, if you told a person in English, like what, so you went out naked. You were naked, naked, naked. This wouldn't make any sense. You could not imagine uh, a, a Canadian, you know, English mom saying, so you went out naked? I mean, the person would be like, N -n no, I was wearing a leather jacket. <laughs> but with my mom, <laughs> no, but it's a mom thing. Like my mom used to say that to me as well. 
And also my dad, actually. <laughs> 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 to think of it. jacket. Who do you think you are? In California? What is uh, it? Listen, uh, what that's what you California. took out of my story? Yeah. What are you trying to be yeah. cool for Ugi? Yeah. I am trying to be cool with her. Ugi's yeah, so cool that I got to <laughs> look good next uh. to him. But uh, no, I'm, it, I mean, it's a, yeah, I don't know why I was wearing a leather jacket. It was stupid. I thought, well, it's, you know, it's, it'll be a brisk walk. You know, Oogie and I, it's usually, the walk is usually about half an hour. It's like in the, in the early morning. Today it was like eight minutes. It's like, get over here. Let's go back, Oogie, which is fine with him. He runs back, you know, he's freezing as well. But uh, yeah, this, did, did your mom say that? Of course, always. She'd be like, I wonder where that started. Where did the Lucht, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Shia? But it's funny because my girlfriend even says it like she grew up here most of her life, and then she says that to her kids. She's right. like, "You're going out <laughs> or whatever." Like, <laughs> why are you going out naked? Yeah, we are master of exaggerating. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. And and you got to think about like what's the what is the tipping point where you're wearing enough clothing that you're no longer naked? You know, <laughs> uh, because clearly it it isn't a full outfit including a jacket. It, it has to be a certain kind of coat and perhaps a hat and a scarf, and then you're no longer looked right <laughs> no, no longer no. Uh, the struggle you know. it's so funny that I, I was waiting to say that and see if you guys if this was just my mom or if everybody's mom says the look thing yeah. that's kind of uh, very telling you know what, Keon? Yes. Shian? We are on an ongoing mission. <laughs> I believe we are. To build an audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian e- diaspora identity. And we are coming to you, where? by which I mean the audience. You tell where? On SoundCloud, Instagram, the YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Telegram, and Castbox. That's our latest yes. platform. Yes, you yeah. told me about this the other day. It's, yeah. is, what is it exactly? Some kind it's of. It's a platform. Ah, ah yeah. yes. Like you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's our latest platform. I'll excuse myself <laughs> to another coffee now. <laughs> but you know, um, rather than you know worry about all those platforms, rookmedia.com is our the hub of all things Rook. That's our website if you want anything there. And we now have a guest directory. Um, I know that Shia, as Minister of uh, uh, All Things Musical and Audio, you're very busy in this darkened little room that you have and with your bag of magic mushrooms and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was a joke. I'm not a uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the cat out of the bag, dude. <laughs> Can we interview Shia while on mushrooms? <laughs> That's, uh, I'd pay to see You that. know, Let's people write to me and they're like, um, uh, is Shia a stoner? Because he sounds like a stoner. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, what? Like, um, anyway, uh, Shia, I don't know if you've seen, there's a guest directory on the website. No, uh, actually. Next time you've got your lysergics or your hallucinating (laughs) or whatever, go look at the uh, rookmedia.com. You can go to, it says guests, and and every guest we've ever had on is is in a list there, and you just click on them, and it takes you to the episodes that they were on, Mm -hmm. which is what one normally finds on a website but <laughs> I thought that that was really great you know our website is making we've come a long we've way we've come a long way sister we're only nine and a half months old but you know we're getting and as of today we'll have the latest edition of hospitality Chef Haas has made a video where he's actually showing us how to cook something and that will be at rookmedia.com all right enough hijinks Moral Mohammadi coming up in just a few moments, but first, it's Thursday, and you got to know what that means. She's a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, a kook who can be erratic, but lovable, smart, and funny, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Batshaha. It's all Persian to us with Kion Nademi. <laughs> You know, you, know, <laughs> you know when you call me a gym fanatic, it actually sounds like a joke these days, uh, just due to the lack of gym. You know what my favorite part of this, uh, this the show is is that you're you're sitting there, and we're already talking, and then I do an introduction. And it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like why don't I just go? Okay, now it's all for us. Let's go. When we do this yeah. big introduction. How do you think I feel? Just, I'm just I sitting know. here awkwardly. Uh, maybe you should. Uh, well, uh, well, okay. Anyway. It's all Persian. Uh, what is uh, what do you have for us in your oh, your bag of tricks? Like I've already mentioned, uh, for me, I'm I'm feeling a lot of pain due to oh. the lack of gym and lack of uh, seeing friends and people. It's you know it's a strange time yes. for everybody. It's been an extremely difficult year for people around the world. Everyone suffered in some way or another, and some more than others. The pandemic has thrown many of us into trying times, where all hope seems lost. 
But see, that's the one thing we'll always have, oh. hope. Oh. The one thing we can count on, even during our darkest days, is hope. It's always darkest before the dawn, and the one thing we can all say with certainty is that the sun will shine again. So, okay, now uh, this is the point where I stop you and try and guess what is all Persian to us. I'm, well, I, that's what I was leading to, yeah, Jean, yeah. yes. The sun? Well, the well, sun. Okay. We created the sun. <laughs> we but hold on, let, the sun. Let we created me, the sky. Let me, let me give you some clues. Oh, you. As I said, brighter days are ahead of us. Now, there's a very common saying that many of us use, usually during our darkest days, when there's no end in sight. We say it to ourselves or to people around us when hope is needed. It's a saying used as a reminder. Can you guess what it is? Mm, May I? My, my life sucks. <laughs> <laughs> kill me, kill me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, got, I, I think, think I know. Just of yourself in a corner, really suicide. I'm kidding. The, no, uh, of course I'm kidding. <laughs> this, will, this will pass. Yes, but this y- this too shall pass. Yes, this too shall go. pass. Oh. Yes, there you go. Yes, <laughs> the Shia song. Oh. We cannot have an episode <laughs> wow. of Rook without promoting Shia wow. song. This In, too shall. This too shall. These two shall pass. <laughs> In these books that add, or better known when translated to English. This too shall pass. Yeah. And yes, I hear Shia has a song about this. Yes, and interestingly, actually, uh, I was guest on moral uh, program for Shabe Yalla, mm-hmm. and I sang Did the song, song This Too Shall yeah. Pass. And interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Huh, we all come full circle. <laughs> yeah, wow. So this timeless saying actually has Persian origins. Oh! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Very interesting uh, for I'm me. I'm curious too. how you were going to justify <laughs> that, that statement. <laughs> Dating back to the 13th century, a Sufi poet by the name of Fereydun Attar wrote a very wise fable. The story goes that a Persian king was once feeling quite sad from the troubles he faced ruling an entire nation. He gathered the wisest men from his vast empire to ask them one very important question. How does one instantly become happy during times of great sadness? Mm -hmm. The wise men scratched their heads in confusion and threw themselves into a deep state of contemplation. What magic, what sorcery is known to have such an effect? They exclaimed. They were English. They, they, according they had, to they my story, yes. accents, yeah. <laughs> it just sounds better when you say it in a British accent. What, what right? type of sorcery did they have? Did they have? <laughs> what <laughs> makes me instantly happy? <laughs> Cocaine, just, sir. I just feel the need to <laughs> say it in an English accent. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so Dave, these were these were potentially Persians with <laughs> with a deep cock. Well, they were wise men. Accent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of? <laughs> What type of sorcery <laughs> is this then? I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Right? What I don't makes under- you so Excuse happy. me, Mr. King. What type of sorcery? Listen, mate. I don't know what makes. All you right, I'm throwing in the towel. Okay. So please so, do it again. So, what was the part where you? With you? What magic? What sorcery is known to have such an effect? Oh boy. Bob, so right, days yeah. passed. Days passed by until finally. One of the wisest men finally had the answer. He immediately marched over to the king and handed him a very simple ring he had made for him. The king looked down upon the ring and read the words inscribed on it. This too shall pass. This instantly brought a smile back to the king's face as he was reminded that the dark days shall soon pass. So from then on, whenever the king was feeling sad and so full of sorrow, he simply glanced down at his ring and read the words, this too shall pass, mm. and remembered that brighter days would come back once again. Now, the catch was that it also had the opposite effect. During times of great happiness, whenever the king looked down at that very same ring, he would be reminded that the good days will too soon pass. Mm-hmm. Life is but a fleeting moment, the good times and the bad. This too shall pass, and this too has Persian roots. It's all Persian to us. Oh. Mm-hmm. That was beautiful. It was interesting, wasn't it? It was very interesting. Well, very well done. Uh, uh, in the middle of uh, making fun of you, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed the. Was the king Persian? Yes, it was a oh. Persian oh. king. So okay. this was. Well, a I, see, I was thrown off by the English accents. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe this was a king Doesn't in England. It fit though. I just it just feels right when I read it in a British accent. <laughs> I just really want to do it in British. Okay, leave me alone. <laughs> in ancient Persia, they had learned a deep, a Birmingham brogue. <laughs> Might I add, yours is pretty good. Gian. I mean, that's I where I grew up, right? I was I'm a London boy. <laughs> wait, wait, Don't wait, forget that's that. 
Cockney yeah. accent, isn't it? Well, I'm a South London. What, 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 what you want? Can uh. you do a Bremmy, Bremmy accent? <clears throat> Birmingham. Uh, I, I'll come from you close, close to Birmingham, Dudley. Ah, I come from that's Dudley. actually yeah. spot on. Thank you. That's spot on. All this right. is the highlight of this whole segment. <laughs> 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 I mean, can the next person, it's all person to ask me that we invented the English <laughs> accent <laughs> because <laughs> apparently that's what it. we learned from this story. Uh, uh. That <laughs> Anyway, that is fascinating. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I don't want to doubt the, the, the sources here, but how, how, where did that story come from? So this was an old uh, story, essentially, that the Sufi poet uh, Faridun Attar actually, actually wrote. Sorry, and sorry, actually, sorry, it's sorry, been, sorry. go ahead. Fariduddin Attar. Fariduddin. But see, when I sorry. when I looked at it online, a lot of people pronounced it or writ, wrote it as Fariduddin. Oh, yeah. yeah it was so I think that was the Persian version of his name. Did you know this, Shia? That it's uh, this too shall pass was actually a, uh, a Persian. Uh, actually, saying? I know it's. Uh, I mean, its origin was Persian, but I didn't know the story, and it was really mm-hmm. interesting. And actually, so this has been adapted as well so I, I believe it was the 19th century when the Jew in the Jewish culture they adapted the story and used King Solomon mm. and fit him into this whole mm-hmm. thing as well and of course many other people great people like Abraham Lincoln uh, as well used it in a speech uh, I forget what year but he referenced that you think he was great well, you know what well, did he, he was, do he was all right <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well that is uh, that is fascinating thank you Keon uh, another edition of it's all Persian to us Kiam will be back uh, as well as Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, Chef Hoss is coming up uh, with uh, another edition of Hospitality before too long. But let's get to our feature guest today. She is an Iranian British musician, TV producer, and presenter based in London, England. If you've been watching Manoto television in recent years or Iran International very recently, you will likely recognize her. Marol Mohammadi was born in Tehran where she studied music. She moved to London to continue her studies in cello, performance, and composition. After gaining her master's degree in composition, Maral worked as a cellist and composer for many years, collaborating with prominent artists such as Mark Lockhart, Sevan, Radio Tehran, Mohsen Namju, Pupini Sisters, and Dangsho to name a few. Maral has performed and had her music performed around the world, including in Iran, England, Scotland, Germany, USA, Israel, and more. In 2016, she had a career change and started producing and hosting music programs and specials for Manoto Television. And after five years at Manoto, Maral is now producing and hosting a culture show called Panjare on the Iran International Network. And right now, Moral Mohammadi joins me from London, England today. Hello. Hi. Wow, what an introduction. I, what I an no introduction. Idea. I've done so many things. You have. <laughs> it's so good to talk to you again. Thanks for doing this. Yes, you too. You know, the first since the first time I saw you on Manitou, uh, say two or three years ago, I thought I thought you really stood out. I mean, in in a, in a great way. You certainly have a uh, I don't know how to parse this. You have a different look and style from most Persian television <laughs> presenters. And, and, and I suppose you have more latitude to bring personality when you're doing arts and music programming. Would you say you've always been more alternative than the norm? I feel like once you call yourself alternative, it, you kind of stop being alternative. Like <laughs> if, true. if I seem like that, first of all, it's very good to hear that you thought that I stand out, hope, hopefully in a, in a good way. Absolutely. I, I still don't like looking at myself on TV and it's still like weird and like uncomfortable. But for the style and the look, I wouldn't say that I choose to be alternative. I put this in co- air, air quotes, but uh, I'm alternative by nature. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of like style wise, I always felt annoyed when something that I liked became in fashion because I hated to see that something that I liked was worn by a lot of people because it meant that oh, now I can't wear it because right. everyone would think that I'm wearing it because right. uh, and it's in fashion. But you're not conservative. Yeah, or- you're not a conservative person. That's what I. That's what I would yes. say by looking at you, and by yes. by watching your style as you present and uh, the questions you ask. And that maybe I've got my own stereotypes about the way Persian TV at least used to be. Maybe it's it's progressing, but mm-hmm. but to me it's very refreshing to see someone who's less conservative as a presenter on a big network. 
It's very nice to hear. Thank you. But how, however, this was this is probably one of the reasons. One of the reasons. Not. I don't want to uh, put my lower social media presence only down to this. But I think this is one of the reasons that compared to a lot of like most of uh, other colleagues that I had at Manoto who were also presenters, I have the least follower. <laughs> like people people do not do not really like how I look. Like you think the, that's the majority why? don't really like it, but you well, know, artists like yourself um seem to like it you you is, think that's why you have less of a following in social media i mean wouldn't I like it be to that think you're that that's the only reason and it's not that because i'm not likable and i'm not fun to follow no you are but i would think it's because the programming you do is a little bit more niche you're not you know you're mm. not anchoring the big news show or something like that so naturally you're gonna or or the big pop kind of stuff so uh i would take pride in having less followers because i you're, do actually you're, you've yeah. got your own cultivated thing right why don't you like looking at yourself on television i think there are a couple of reasons one is that when i started i really started with all my guards up thinking that oh this is a temporary thing i'm a musician this is not who i am this is not what i should be doing so like don't accept this then when i started being on camera i thought that i can't be my true real self because i'm um, at the same time that I'm quite positive looking and I'm usually, I seem energetic mm -hmm. and I'm, yeah. I, I, I love making people laugh. Um, at the same time, I have a very dark and sarcastic mind. <laughs> I don't really have an optimistic view on things. So I felt like I can't be this, my true self in front of camera. At least when I was in Manoto, um, I never quite find the persona that I wanted to be on camera either. Like I couldn't be as um, like bubbly and and again I put this in air quotes like girly uh, kind of image that mm -hmm. you want that that you see a lot and it's expected from a Manoto presenter. I couldn't have that. I, I couldn't do that. Um, but I also couldn't be this very strict and dry person because I wasn't a news anchor. So it was this weird, yeah. not quite developed persona. Did they ever try to um, streamline you? I mean, did anybody ever, uh, a, a producer or an executive say, you know, please put some you know, blonde streaks in your hair or wear more makeup or shoulder pads or something? <laughs> not, not blonde streaks in my hair because when I started there, I had a crazy half blonde, half black hair right. and my hair changed a lot but uh look wise like after a couple of years we had a stylist so they kind of did give me clothes to wear and i always felt very uncomfortable in them like the fact that you had to have studio makeup was uncomfortable for me because i don't apart from lipstick i'm not very big on makeup generally um so all of these things i, I think were things that added to me not liking to look at myself from from the outside it did it looked like you it, it looks like you do have the latitude and and it's that's that's why it's so refreshing and 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 i'm not just referring i shouldn't i should clarify that when i say this alternative it's not just the way you look or or even your personality but but the, the real content i mean you you the stories you pursue the way you ask questions the kind of ideas that you want to get out there um are just not always mainstream they're they're interesting to me and i and i really appreciate that that's Persian audiences uh, have um, no shortage of opinions and uh, nazar about like what, <laughs> what you're supposed to look like and everything as well. Did you hear from audiences about your uh, alternative style? Yes, but that doesn't like that kind of nazar uh, and like putting their nose into everyone's business didn't only apply to me because I didn't like I looked a bit different or talked a bit different that that's what people do like i saw it in like when with my colleagues as well that especially when you start at the beginning yeah. they everyone has a lot of opinions about everything that you <laughs> do and have and yeah. say like like one of the most common questions that i had which is very common for any iranian woman or girl um is why haven't you had a nose job or 
when are you having a nose job oh. and when you say i don't want like never like I, i've never wanted to have a nose job oh <gasps> really but you would be so much prettier it's like first of all i like my nose second why do i need to be prettier to your like i'm here to tell you about this amazing album that came out this great artist that i found and i think you would like or this event that is happening or this crazy technology that japan created for making music why do you care about my nose just like i mean as long as i'm presentable and clean in front of camera this would be a stranger well, saying this to you like, yeah like th these are random people on instagram but like i said it's not just me this is this right, is a thing right. that people oh, uh, whenever i said any of this to any non-iranian friend or any of our non-iranian colleagues when they found that people ask us this they're like but why like they they wouldn't even they haven't even noticed that our nose might right. be a, a subject to to a plastic surgery. although although when i see myself on camera sometimes i write to myself and say why didn't you get a nose job so, <laughs> <laughs> please do but, something but about no, that the, the thing the, is we we do put a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on the look of the person that is telling us something yeah, yeah. like a very good example that happened to me today. Usually I dress not conservative, but I don't show skin on camera. I usually wear long sleeve or like my neckline is usually in a reasonable uh, place, reasonable, again, air quotes, uh, trousers. I'm, I never dress any revealing clothes on camera. It's just a personal choice. I just don't want the <laughs> focus to go anywhere else. I recorded something yesterday for my next show and there is a shadow of my necklace on on my chest that looks like cleavage it's not even <laughs> cleavage the shadow of my necklace looks like cleavage uh -huh. that promo was posted on instagram page of our channel half the comments <laughs> are about that cleavage right it's like half of the people are saying I couldn't even listen to what you say. <laughs> I'm only t looking at your, uh, at that line. Oh my God, that line. It's, In <laughs> it's like, I mean, I'm talking to you about like, right. what, oh, like it's, and looking at that on your phone, it's a tiny thing. Even if it was cleavage, you wouldn't even see much because it's just like a few pixels. It's amazing that Iranians but, are, are this, are they're particularly poru, hey? Like they, like it's like, uh, no, there's no, um, like they don't sort of edit themselves in these no, kind no. of comments. But they do, they do if they're in front of you. Like <laughs> right. they, they, they're, they're not brave enough to say a lot of these things. But that, that's, you know, that's the thing with social media. Right, that right. People Although I, 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 I don't know, man. I, 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 every, I find when Iranians meet me in person, I find that sometimes the, the tact, <laughs> the tact is, is, I mean, it's, you know, they'll say, oh, Jianchu, Topoli should you, huh? And like, or something like that. I'm like, what? Oh my you know, God. Like, be like, I mean, I There's no filter on, right. on, on some of these <laughs> right. things. They, they do, because I, I think it's, it's deeper than this. It's deeper than what social media has done generally to society. This whole having your nose in everyone's business, it is like, I've seen it in in family, in, in my family, in friends. In, it's a thing that people think is okay to say. Right. So what is the point? What are you trying to achieve when you see someone? I say, oh, 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 topol should ya. Like, I dude. swear, I swear to you, this is a true story. I went to an event a couple of, about a year and a half ago. I think it was around, uh, actually, I think it was around Noru's time or something. And it was one of those, you know, uh, gala events. There was a bunch, of, and a bunch of people came around me, were to, to, you know, to say hello, and and a a an argument broke out because, like, a guy said, uh, uh, and then and then a woman said, nah, and they started like debating my weight in, in front of me. I didn't even say anything. I was just standing there. Like you amazed, don't exist. yeah. You're just just, the just for listening their, to for their degrees of whether I've gained or lost weight. Um, listen, one of the things I notice about you, I mean, you've been the producer, the presenter, 
of these, a lot of these music shows that I'm met at all, including one called mm. Echo that you did for a few years. Now you've got mm. Panjere on, on Iran International. You're, mm. you're the person behind that too. I, I don't think I could find a program where you were hosting, but not the producer or co-producer or creator as well. How much of a control freak are you? <laughs> I didn't expect you ending the question like this, but very. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's take a step back. <laughs> Bevin, first of all, if I ever had the choice, I would prefer just producing and not presenting. But that is a different, like me being a control freak is not the reason that I always produce and present. Um, the fact that uh, I had this experience so many times that I delegate, mm. I give something to someone else to do is that, okay, this is how you do it. You know how to do it. Like you're an editor, you've done this many times, just do this, or you're a producer, make this package for the show. And I look at it and I, you know, I think that, okay, they, they're on it. And I look at it at the end and I'm like, I have to redo this <laughs> and redoing because it's not good. It's not, it's not. Moral, John, it's not I think that's yet. the textbook definition of a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, I don't like telling people off. Right, I, I'm right. terrible at telling people off. I'm terrible at saying, okay, this is wrong. Do this again. You know, you, like I, I prefer doubling my own work than to tell someone that what they did was not arable. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not a control freak, but I'm saying that me presenting and producing everything has other reasons. Can I, can I, I, I don't mean to, I don't want to call bullshit, but the, uh, the, I think you like the presenting thing too, don't you? I mean, when you say you, would you really want somebody else to be fronting Panjere? I mean, that no. seems like it's, ah, it's your baby, gonna, right? Uh, with Panjere is different. Panjere, um, I'm a lot more comfortable with the presenting side of it as well, because I dress myself, I put my own makeup on, um, I, dis I, I can choose how it looks exactly. So I don't feel like I need to look like something that someone else expects me or this channel expects me uh, to be, or the viewers, like even the viewers, it's not just the people, like it's not just Mano To that was trying to make me look like, like wear heels or have the certain amount, a certain amount of makeup on. The viewers also expect this, like uh, like the viewers that Mano To has um, would not react well to m what I wear, hmm. like what I choose to wear. But in Panjere. I don't actually hate looking at myself. It's fine. It's, I mean, it's, I still prefer, as in I still like to have more help on it uh, because right now, you know, I write it and, and present it and edit it and produce it. Like I do everything. Um, you literally sit and do the editing yourself? Yeah. You know, your realm has been music, arts, and culture. And when you're mm. producing a culture show like you are now, um, I'm curious what you see as the most important part of it. What is your goal doing an arts and culture program? What do you really hope to achieve? I love teaching. Like when I when I left Tehran to come to London to study, my plan was to come to London, study, learn, um, and go back to Iran and be a good teacher to people who want to learn and don't have a good teacher and then life happened and now I'm here 18 years later I'm still here mm -hmm. uh, but generally I love teaching and it's actually the reason that I th even thought about being in television that I thought that okay if I'm given a platform like a television to teach I can approach a lot like so many more people and ch children hmm. so it would be worth it Still, I have this uh, mindset that if I can teach or show something to even one person in every each episode, if I can affect one person and make them interested in painting or music mm -hmm. or want to follow a path in any art form. I think part of that is, uh, and part of the reason I think you do a good job of it is uh, respecting your subjects and and bringing some um, 
real content or right? maybe um, intellectual heft to what you do. You know, my, my first gig in media, my first real gig was doing uh, a TV show, uh, a culture show, well, kind of like a Pangea in English, though, you know. And um, and I had been this musician who was then doing that. And soon people said, oh, that, those, that was a really good interview with this band or this artist. And we hadn't seen that uh, side of them. And I realized that having been a musician, that oftentimes, you, you know, even really good interviewers who would um, do a lot of research or prepare or have some really erudite questions that they would ask of a normal interviewee, when it comes to like somebody who's playing rock music or an artist of some kind, you know, start to just ask them kind of um, silly pop questions like, uh, you know, how's the tour going? Or, uh, mm. you know, have you met any girls? Or, or whatever the questions are. And and so they get that kind of response. It, it turns into kind of a, a fun whatever interview at best. But, but if you actually ask the questions, if you actually um, do the work, you know, that the artists, that the people, the, the rapper or whoever you're bringing on has as interesting or more interesting things to say than any academic or politician or whomever. And so it's kind of about, you know, affording that respect. And it's something that I see you do. It was why I asked the question about what, what you see as important, because it's almost like you want people to discover um, some of the art that isn't necessarily at the top of the charts or the, the really obvious stuff. And you want to do that through uh, something with substance. Would that be right? Well, yeah, I'm glad that it has gone through. Yes, I think like about what you said about if if a musician interviews another musician, the kind of questions that they ask is different. I think part of it also comes from the fact that it's a question that you faced, not when you thought of talking to this person, but generally in life, you've in, in experience, you've faced this question right. and now you have someone that you can ask. I, I learned one trick from Louis Chegnavarian many years ago. For anyone who doesn't know him, he's this incredible composer uh, and conductor. When I was about 16, um, I used to play in Tehran Symphony Orchestra. Uh, he, he came to conduct us as a guest conductor. Before Loris, all of the concerts of um, the Symphony Orchestra was just like only the ground floor was full. He came. And he would play like Brahms symphony or like these really heavy orchestral pieces. But also at the end, he played some uh, Strauss valses and made people clap with them. And he had like a toy gun with him, hmm. he would shoot one of the cellists at the end. Like he made it fun. He made it light and accessible, like, uh, like understandable yes. Yes. for the, the main audience. Yes, Those were the things that brought the audience to the hall which like in all of his concert like up to the third balcony in Talar Vahdat it was like full like we were like there, there's no place to even drop a needle Susanna Amnemishot Bendazi I translated that to English I was amazed by like his simple and very effective system and i tried i mean not as successfully and not as extremely but i tried to kind of use this as a guide when i was talking about the new releases of the week i would show all the orash um, and saucy and you know all of the top pop um musicians that have followers yes but at the same time, like right after that, I would talk about the uh, electroacoustic music festival that was happening in Tehran and the winners and play some of their music that was only to uh, um, a lot of people is just noise, but like to, to show them a bit of other side of the music right, as well right. or what other people like. I tried to kind of use the mainstream music to show people the alternative and and like the niche side of the music as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. You you lure them into the store with mm. the with the big sale and then you uh, exactly. uh sell them on something with substance. Well, that that's 
very interesting, and it makes sense to me watching you what you, what you do. Also, it's interesting that you were a teenager in the Tehran Symphony. Uh, that's <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> speaks to your talent. I want to actually ask you about your story and growing up in Iran and coming here. But before we leave this piece about arts and culture, uh, I want to ask you. You know, you're in touch with a lot of people in the arts sector. You're there in London. You interview them on your shows. This this pandemic, obviously, Moral, as you know, has been really hard on a lot of careers, but really hard on musicians and dancers mm-hmm. and performers of any kind in the cultural sector. Uh, there was an editorial a few days ago in the New York Times beseeching lawmakers in the U.S. to help fund the arts sector to keep it alive. It's dying, you know, during this pandemic. I know the British government has done a better job in this realm during COVID, has given some bursaries or, 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 or mm. put some money back into the arts sector. Do you believe governments should be stepping in to help right now? Of course, of course. The thing is, I think a lot of people really underestimate the effect of art in our lives and how important it is. It's, I mean, imagine this whole lockdown without any music, any films to watch, any books to read, any of the arts to come and aid you in in the time that you had to be stuck in at home. Like none of us would have survived. None of us would have even been able to do it for a week. And to think that they don't, they don't belong to the top five priority. Like I right. think that it might be a bit extreme, but the the medical workers, the all of that, and artists are in the top ten. Like the, the artists uh, affected the society and how important it is for governments, for people, for anyone that can help step in and and make sure they survive is is crucial i think governments should put it in their right, what's it right. what is it in english like the top priority priority uh, I, I, and it's, it's not a new idea i mean there's been times yeah. throughout history where governments have commissioned big murals or or all kinds of ways to mm. to 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 um build the culture of your locale, but also to help the artistic sector. And um, this is, I mean, if, how bad is it from your view with regards to Iranian artists in the diaspora? How bad have they been hit this year? It's re- like, I mean, you say England has been a bit better. It has been better, but it's not like they've done a great job either. Our government here was, uh, it's just like, it make it upsets me even to think about it. Um, our, like, they live off, I mean, especially Iranian artists, they live off gigs, like selling albums and selling tracks and stuff yeah. is, you know, it's not a moneymaker for, for any Iranian artist. And to not be able to, to do that for a year, I don't know how they've survived. A lot of them haven't. A lot of them have started doing other jobs. Like I have a friend who started delivery service because they're the jobs that have suddenly bloomed yeah. and yeah. he couldn't have any gigs like there's nothing for him to do and he was going crazy at home so he started delivering um it's terrible it's terrible i feel i feel for them and there was this thing that um i think it started in summer that um the there was this i don't remember what the hashtag was but radiohead um, started this mm, right, yeah. to I think Radiohead started it I don't want to give I think so too I remember what you're talking about it was... yeah that they actually they were more focused on a uh, crew of that's like, right. event crews that's right but it should be for anyone that um, their life is if, has been affected by this lockdown as extreme as musicians instrumentalists like even composers there are events I'm well, sure any performers the, the right ones. dancers mu- Dance, uh, yeah. comedians uh, magicians I mean it's not just musicians it's like yeah. it, it, all of those things and especially in the Iranian artist sector you're absolutely right uh, and, and especially those artists that may have a big following in Iran but they can't monetize it through record sales or whatever they monetize mm. it through playing gigs in the diaspora and and uh ticket sales and merch and things like that um so it's it's uh it's very tough and and when you say they are going through a hard time they would be you if you didn't have your tv gig right exactly. now, right i mean you're the I've, right 
I, I've been so lucky. Like, I can't believe how, like, I quit my job at Manoto in February last year, right before the lockdown. So I had a month of being at home. I was loving it. I was like, oh, I can sleep when I want, get up when I want. And this is, this is amazing. And then in March, we went to lockdown. You couldn't apply. Like, everyone was letting people go. Yeah. I couldn't apply for a new job. I couldn't like even imagine that I can get a new job. And I was hired in lockdown. Like I had my interview over the phone. So I was one of the, I'm, I'm so ha grateful and, and aware of how lucky I was. But yes, you're right. If if I wasn't um, in TV production now, that, that they would have been us. Like it would have yeah. been me. Um, which in brackets i have to say i'm as at the same time as i am glad that it's not me i'm also sad because i'm sad that i can't call myself a musician like when people ask me what do you do i can't say i'm a musician i say i'm a tv producer and quietly i say musician <laughs> it's so funny I feel like a fraud uh, when i say that one of the questions i have for you is that is is uh that i wanted to get to is it, whether it's strange for you that people people there are i'm sure you've realized this at this point but there are going to be people around the world who know you only as a TV personality, they, mm. they, they will not, they wouldn't even know at all that you're an artist, that you're a musician. How does yeah. that feel? Does it bother you? Of course it does. Of course it does. It is for the longest time, like all my life, I thought that nothing is worth doing except art, anything to do with art, music, painting, writing, play, acting, whatever. Um, I still think that nothing is worth doing except it's related to art. See, now I've kind of changed my statement <laughs> right. a little bit that is related to art. Um, but yeah, of course it upsets me. I've, I've spent a very long time. All I've done, as in all my life, I've done music. There were times that I've done other things too, but I lived off music. I, I, not only I paid my rent with music, I lived music. Mm -hmm my my interaction my friends my mm -hmm. my fun time and my work time and my relaxed time everything was music wait a few wait a few more years it'll get even worse i mean i spent 10 years on the road as a musician 10 years mm -hmm. and now i'll be interviewing some young musician and they'll be like uh yeah, well, as a media guy, you wouldn't understand, but touring can be really, and I'll just be yeah. like sinking into my seat, you know, going, I was there, you know, but, uh, yeah, but the, I mean, I it's, been, it's 15, 20 years ago for me, right? So even uh, now, I've experienced it a couple of times that, especially, I've, I've experienced this more with rappers. They talk to you like, you don't know, <laughs> you don't know things, you don't know what you're saying, you boring woman who's making. TV shows. I'm the one living a gangster life and I'm an artist and I'm an artist. I'm making art. Yeah, but just to be fair, I mean, dude, you are a cellist. You're not exactly a gangster. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a gangster. No, I'm a composer more than a cellist. Okay. I've, been, I've been trying for years to want to make people see me as a composer and not the cellist and still I, I haven't. When you say arts has always been the most important to you. Take take me back as a kid growing up in Iran. So, I mean, at what age was it always clear to you and your family that you were a creative type that you would gravitate towards music and arts? I mean, I think a lot of people, like at at an early age, you kind of absorb things from your environment and you find something that you see exciting and interesting, and you kind of gravitate towards it. Um, and for me, uh, like I grew up in an artsy family. My dad is a sculptor. My mom was a potter. Um, my uncle is a musician. And then my older brother, he's one of those annoyingly talented people that anything he does, he's good at, like anything. Like he played music, he was good. He's, a, uh, he's an amazing painter. He's a great filmmaker. It's just annoying hmm. um, how like he touches everything and it's gold. Um, how old was I? I think I was like six, five, six, very young. Uh, my mom took me to an early years music school, like ORF. And uh, that's where it started. They put me to that class, like they took me there every week. And I was like, okay, 
I guess this is what I'll do now. Hmm. So it wasn't that I was a creative type. I um, and I read a lot, and I would like gather leaves when I whenever went to walk. Like I had this huge. I made a booklet out of just leaves. I was going to ask you about co- collecting leaves. Why? Why? why what, I don't know. This? I'm just like I was a, like I, I I saw little weird things and I picked them up. I had like a huge collection of lost sock like baby socks like i would see a baby sock right. in the street and i was like oh this is lonely i take it home and take care of it and it's like so if like as a child i was and i was a very smart kid i don't know what happened like in in the <laughs> process but i was a very smart child like i i started reading and writing when i was four because um i wanted someone to read for me and no one would read fast enough or had enough time to wow. read as much as I wanted them. Look so my dad yeah. was like, okay, sit down. I'm going to teach you how to read. So I read at the age of five. The The earlier music classes turned into violin lessons. Uh, like when I finished that, they were like, okay, now you need to choose an instrument to learn. Like, okay, I want piano. Like, well, we can't afford a piano now. What else? Your brother is learning violin, and we have Amu Arsalon. Arsalon Komkar was a, a yes. is a family friend. Wow! So it's like Amu Arsalon can teach you. So okay, I learned violin, and um, so I learned violin for a few years, and then I took my violin one day to my mom. I was like, "Mom, this is too like the pitch is too high. I don't like this. This hurts my ear. I don't want to play this anymore." So I stopped playing violin because. The range was too high. Like, I didn't like the high range. Uh, I was very, very um, special. <laughs> At the age of 10, I did an audition to get into the music school for girls. And I got in. Again, they asked me, what do you want to play? I said, well, I like piano. It's like, no, 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 we have too many pianists. What else? It's like, well, I used to play violin. It's like, well, what else? I said, well, cello. So like, okay, your height and your hand and this and that is good for cello. Go and learn cello. So a lot of it was like a lot of me getting into music was because my mom took me to music classes. I was good at it. I enjoyed it. But it wasn't that I begged my mom to take me to music right, class right. and they took me. It was a thing that I was taken to and I stuck to it. Then towards the end of music school, like when I was 17 or 16, we started thinking that I had to leave Iran to carry it to kind of continue the study. And then at the age of 18, I kind of came to London. Well, that was my That was where I was going to go with it. Thanks for the segue. Cause you, you <laughs> end up leaving Iran. I mean, that's still a relatively young age, 18 years old. Mm. And, and it sounds like this is always interesting to me. I mean, this is a, I've had a couple of people on the show now where, I mean, as someone who grew up in the West, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the jigsaw puzzle that is, that is Iran in the, early 21st century or the late 20th century, you know, so people like Reza Rohani, who comes from this amazing lineage and and is excelling as a piano player in Iran, is sent away, you know, and and it's so strange to me because normally you would, you know, well, if your dad's, you know, uh, such an accomplished person, why not stay in Iran? And and it was like, no, I had to go elsewhere to really uh, challenge myself or to be better, or that's where they sent me. How hard was the decision in you in your case for you and your family for you to uh, to leave? If it was up to me, I wouldn't have left because I was too young to know that if I actually do want to continue with this I would have a better chance at doing it outside Iran but I was 18 I had my first boyfriend I was you know I thought I'm in love and like oh we cannot live without each other I don't want to go and um, so if it was up to me I would have stayed there and probably you know broken up with the guy like a month later and uh, been miserable ever since. <laughs> right. But um, for me, it was very difficult. It started all sorts of, you know, when I when I first moved to London, all the stress uh, made me lose a lot of my hair. I have depression since. The, the stress of the stress it's, of what of being alone, of leaving like. Like I, I had a lot of like everyone at that age has a lot of friends, and your life is your friends. But I was like my my friendly life was 
very strong like i had i had a lot of friends i had a lot of interaction with the friends it, it and i really liked my life there um so leaving that and coming to somewhere with with the culture shock and like being pulled away from everything you know and you, thinking at that age that oh i'm not gonna have, make any other friend any friends that are as like our bond is as strong as like so and so right um it it did really affect me hard and i think it's easier for people when they really want to leave um and all those difficulties um you know they they can handle it easier because they have a goal they have a they they feel like they're on a mission and it makes it easier but i didn't want to leave um i'm very glad that i have but i didn't want to back then i want i, I was like I even went back like after getting um, accepted in one of the in, in two of the conservatoires that I applied for. I went back and said that like, mom, dad, I got did the audition. So, you know, that I'm not saying I don't want to go because I can't go, but I don't want to live uh, away from home. I, I can't do it. I won't survive. I'll be dust. I like it was very dramatic. And uh, they convinced me that, okay, Mama and John, go start it, then you'll get into it. And I did get into it, and I'm glad that I did stay. How did immigration and that that difficult um, adjustment for you affect you as an artist? <sighs> or did it? It did, yes. Like, I remember my teacher, one of my teachers in in college always commenting on how my background and what I'm learning now, like back then, what I, what I learned here kind of shows like you, you have the accent, like you have the lahje, you have the like the tone of an immigrant or the tone of your home home um, in what you create. And I'm not sure if it's necessarily a good thing, um, but it definitely shows not only to the sounds that you hear, but also I feel like it brings an extra layer. Like any any art piece is kind of enriched by how deep or how strong the story behind it is, hmm. I think. Like even a painting that if, if you know that that painting, like the painter did this when like they just lost their father, you you see it in the painting and it kind of gives you extra... What if you don't extra... know that the painter lost their father, but you're looking at it? I think I think you would see something in there. Mm. Like, I think it would show. Like, I think you can see that there is there is like a darkness in there. There There's something in an art piece that is created with a deeper, heavier story. And I feel, especially at the beginning when I came... Um, that pain and that home, like feeling homesick and missing home and all of that, missing my family, I'm very close to my family, missing them. It did come through um, at anything that I wrote. Um, and I think if I, if I write now, it will also show because right. you know i'm missing home a lot i'm like i'm in tears every other day or every day seeing anything about iran anything about my family i like i have times that i see an ad about i don't know like especially during christmas when there are family ads um, like ads that they show family happy together and like they go and visit each other i'm like oh i want to see my family right. um so i think all of this would come through if In i wrote a yeah. piece right yeah. now even if it was a piece if it was meant to be a happy piece how talented are you as a dental assistant ha <laughs> 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 I was wondering if that nugget is going to come up. Uh, that was the first job I had when I came to London and my uncle was a dentist. Because back then you didn't, back then, I can't believe I'm talking, I'm telling a story that <laughs> has the sentence back then. Oh, yeah, in it. yeah, you're getting old. old. Let's face it, yeah. Yeah, we're getting old, man. Um, no, back then you didn't necessarily need a qualification to be a dental nurse. You could learn by practice and the den dentist could, like, could, could say that you're qualified. So that's how I started. And uh, yeah, I was, I was really good. 
Um, so I'm guessing so, you, were, you were doing that to pay the bills. And you, you, of course, you become yeah. this musician. You're this composer. You're in London. You know, the part of the story that I don't, you, you start collaborating with a lot of Iranian musicians and bands. I named some of them in the, in the introduction, um, mm. especially after 2009. It, at that point, you've done your studies. I'm curious why you didn't return to Iran. What was the, because uh, surely that would have come up. Uh, this was the, that you've gone from this place that I don't want to leave. I Please, mm. my friends, my boyfriend, whatever. And so you come and do the studies. Then you end up staying in London. Why? A few times I had the, like, when I finished my degree, I was doing really well as a session musician here. Like, I, I didn't even have a day free. Like, it was amazing. I was playing with all sorts of, um, like different genres of music. I played like hip hop gigs and, and rock. Like these are all non-Iranian. Um, and I was making good money as a, with, with my quartet. We played at weddings and other events. It was, it, was, it was doing, it was going well. And at that point I felt that, okay, I would need another like year or so. Like I had a plan that I, I'll have, I'll stay here for another year. Um, I save this much money and then I'll go back. But I didn't even at that point, I didn't feel like I can live in Iran completely again. I was having plans to kind of do half and half, like be here and there, like move between the two. And then I was like, okay, let's get a master's. So I started studying my master's, which was around the same time that I started collaborating with Iranian musicians like Radio Tehran. Like that, that was the first band that I started playing with. Um, as soon as I started interviewing or my work being featured in Iranian TV channels, like things started to kind of crumble a little bit. Like I went back to Iran once and they didn't like the fact that I've I've been on, you know, Manoto and BBC and VOA and uh, I've played with like Kiosk and uh, Golshifte Farahani. And, you know, there there is some like, this was before uh, you're on TV. This is this is just you as a musician. They didn't like as that. a musician. Yeah. Yes, as a musician. This is like years before I started with Manoto. Is this 2012 where they confiscate your passport at the airport? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, and you know they didn't do anything to me. They didn't hurt me. They didn't. I was fine. But I had to sign uh, and say that I will never do any interview. Or like I would not appear in any of these channels uh, ever again, or work with a uh, band Guru um, Hayyamu on it. Oh boy, like, you, you signed awful. that? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was like, eh, maybe I'll just start working there. Um, right. So after that, I felt like I'm living a half life. I'm not. I'm living in London. I'm having bad the 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 awful bits of every side like i'm living away from my family and my home and my friends and also i'm not taking advantage of the platforms that i have here that that i can have access to and then other like a few other things happened that made me not be able to go back at all ever again or at least for a long while um well moral certainly uh, making the decision to leap to television a few years ago um, and and start that show at Manoto, uh, and of course now Manoto now Iran International. You 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 had to be aware that that decision would have an impact on your ability to travel back to Iran. Um, so was that was that the point where you kind of gave up on the dream of going back there regularly? No, the reason uh, is one of. Like, I couldn't go back to Iran before I started working at Manoto. Why not? Like, they're, they're, Just as a musician? It was cost too much trouble? The, because I was a musician. And there's like other tiny things that I'd rather not get into. Um, because it wasn't for me. It was for other people that kind right. of affected me. Right. And okay. I don't know if I can share their story. I couldn't go back already. Financially, I was in a very crucial place when i got the job offer from manoto like i've i've quit the um dentist job i went uh, for i think about a year uh without <laughs> making it um and i ran out of money i i i was doing like odds gigs here and there but uh, as you probably know it, 
as a session musician, you have to be in the in the loop of yeah. people. Like you need to have your connections alive if you want to be booked for things. Sure. So about I had about a year of just living off my savings. Um, and I was also at a position that I couldn't go back to Iran. And then suddenly this, um, uh, and I had the idea of making that kids show that I said. And the job offer from Manitou came. And at that point I was like, okay, first of all, it's going to pay. Second, it is a possibility. Like this is the only way that I can get in there and uh, possibly um, like make this kids show in a couple of years. And um, why not? I can use this platform to introduce good, like I can do good with this platform. I can make a good use out of it. Um, so the decision on not being able to go back to Iran didn't come when, right, when I right. was thinking of Manoto, but that was like a last nail in the coffin. Like that was yes. definitely like, okay, even if you had a chance before that, if you like laid low for a couple of years and then managed to go back to Iran, now you can't. And it was not an easy decision. And how do you feel about that now? I mean, we all faced, a lot of us faced the same thing, which is uh, it's too precarious to go back to Iran. How do you, how do you feel about that? It's not fun. It's not a fun thought. And um, like last year, I marked, like I went over the 18 years that I've lived in London. Yes. So now I've lived in London longer than I have lived yes. in Tehran. And it is like that day was a very, it, it was a very strange day to, to realize that I can't say I'm as much Londoner as I am a Tehraner. I'm more of a Londoner now. And that I don't like. I don't. I love London. I love being a Londoner. I love this city. It's been great to me. It's been kind and welcoming, but it's difficult. I miss home. I miss, I miss everything about home, even the awful things. Uh, I remember once last, was it last year or the year before, I was upset about, there was like a chain of awful news, like a chain of awful news that was coming from Iran and I was upset like, it was. I was not having a good time, and um, my partner was like, "How? How? Like, how can you be this upset and angry and revolted by a place and miss it as as much as you do at the same time?" Mm. I'm like, "I don't know. I hate it and I love it. I I'm so glad that I live here, but I also miss it. I." I wish I could go back. But I think this is a feeling that a lot of people who yes. didn't really, it's like a, it's like an exile by choice in a way. So if you come to visit us in Toronto and you're walking on the street and somebody says, hey, uh, uh, where, where, where do you come from? Where's home? What do you say? Home is still Tehran. No, I, I home is London. Tehran is home. Home. So you can't even answer the question. You're so confused. No, it's I, hard. I am. Yes, yeah, it's I hard. am. Of course, it is I hard. am. It is like I feel. I feel bad to not say that London is home. I feel bad like about not considering London home. I do think of London as home. Like wherever, whenever I go away, I do miss it here. It is my home. But Tehran is home. Home. It's dif it's a different kind of home. It's a home that you were born in, like your mom brought you to it, your dad brought you to it. But London is a home that I made. Like I, I built this home myself, but that home was built already and I was brought to it. You know, um, I have to, I, there's so much that I've, I've we barely scratched the surface, and I, <laughs> but I know I can't keep you forever. And um, I'm excited about the kind of work you do. Uh, now that you are firmly ensconced in doing television, um, it's been an interesting year for you, I'm sure, going from Manitoba to Iran International. First of all, how did your fans, how did your audience react to that uh, that switch? Um, the, I think Iranian audience generally are <laughs> But by now are very used to uh, seeing Manoto presenters in Iran International because a lot of people, like from every, uh, all channels uh, migrated to Iran International. 
Right. So at the beginning, they kept asking questions. Why did you go? Did they kick you out? Why? And and there are these weird stories that I don't even know who makes them up or or right, right. what kind of brain comes up with this. That did you? This was not a question that asked was asked by, uh, of me, but a colleague of mine who also was at Manitou and left, and they asked her that. Is it true that uh, at Manitou they expect you to get in, uh, to to take part in the um, like triangular sexual relationships, and if you don't take part, they kick you out? Wow. I was like, uh, what? Uh, no, it is. Uh, hmm. how, what 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 makes you think this? What makes you come up with this story? So it, I, I was asked some weird random questions, right, but right. Um, like I said earlier, because I don't have um, that many followers on Instagram, or I wasn't that popular on social media, I got less of this and I ignored them. Like uh, they asked a few times, why did you leave? Why did you leave? And I just ignored it and they just stopped. And now they're like, oh, you're, a, you're you know, they, they accept it. What about, do you care about people who, um, take issue with you working at Iran International because for political reasons, who who it's funded by, or some something that some mm. anchor said, or uh, some political position, or whatever. I I did have a you know I I did think about this was this was the only thing that took some thinking for me to uh, accept the job there or like to apply for the job there um, was this, but. Um, and for example, when they like it was, I haven't started. It wasn't that long after I started that they covered the Mujahideen's event like in that much detail and like for hours. And it was so upsetting for me to see that, and I was really considering leaving. Um, it was it was not a, an easy decision for me to stay. I still don't know if I made the right decision. But yes, it does. It, it, I have thought of that. My reasoning for myself was that, first of all, Manitou, I didn't know where the money comes from. I, if I was okay with that, I mean, the money of that may have come from somewhere even worse than Saudi Arabia. Um, also, where the money comes from to me uh, is less important than what I'm doing with it. Mm. I feel like even if the money comes from Islamic Republic, if I'm doing something good with it, like, great, like the, the, the more money that they have going to something, going towards something good and something positive, I think it's great. I think, I think if more people join and took their money and did something good with it, we would have a better platform for people to choose from. Well, speaking of what you do with it, I asked this question of Farah Farazada a couple a few weeks ago, who was uh, on the show and also from Iran International. You guys are in a very unique position as a broadcaster. You're I, I don't even know if there's there's much of an equivalent almost anywhere in the world where you are broadcasting to a large audience uh, and an audience that's almost I mean most of your audience I assume is inside Iran mm. that most of your audience you have no access to. You can't, uh, you know, you can't go there and do the primary research. You can't go there. So you're speaking to these people um, with a wall in between. Uh, it's a fascinating position to be in. It's a very difficult thing to do as a broadcaster. How do you navigate that? It is. It is. And it's not. And, and all you have to see if a show or something that you've done is successful or not is social media. And it's not a good place to see that because we know that there's only a certain kind of people who would comment on things sure. or yeah. like you you cannot be sure that something that you've done has been a proper failure or a great success and yeah like the research as well like it, it is it's not easy especially like I, I i find it harder to any news or anything to do with art and culture uh, because there are fewer sources for hard news it's easier to find news to find content all of to to have all of that but for us it's just it's really not easy to do the research to be sure how relevant it is to the society like i find things that i'm suddenly very excited about and i like talked to my mom about it and she was like yeah this this happened like five months ago here 
It's like, I, I didn't know. How right, did I miss right. this? She's like, yeah, this was like all the cafes in Tehran were doing this. Well, I, and also you have a huge responsibility. I mean, you are, mm. you are, you are an access point for a lot of people in, in that country who are, you know, get to get to hear about things through you that they wouldn't otherwise get to know about. And that's very significant. It is such a, a pleasure getting to talk to you. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the amount of time you've given us and uh, to do this. You know, I was going to ask you what, um, because you're a musician and because you've covered so much music and, and, and that's got to be in your wheelhouse, what you've been listening to lately. I did see in my research, you, you said in one interview that you don't actually listen to a lot of music, that even <laughs> when you're driving, you prefer audiobooks, which I thought was hilarious for somebody who's like a, such a music proponent. You've been a music journalist, you've been a musician, you've interviewed rock bands, you play classical music, you're a composer. If you're going to listen to something in your comfort zone, what is it? Um, it depends on my mood. Like, it could be Shahram Shapare, it could be Brahms, it could be James Blake. It, it could, it depends on why I'm listening to music. Mm. It is, there, there's never a time that I just play music as a background thing or just because I want some noise in the house. I want, when I, when I want sound in the house, it is like either TV or a TV show. Otherwise, I can't have as as a background thing. It kind of distracts me. Interesting. I, I, I get into it, and um, like that's the reason that I don't listen to music and drive because it takes me. Like I miss exits. I like <laughs> uh, so many near crashes that I had. Because even when, I was even when you're listening to the great Iranian balladeer James Blake. Did, yes, they were. <laughs> <laughs> The well-known Persian, uh, the the Ostad James Blake. I am um, I'm so grateful to you. Listen, but before one last question before I let you go. So we've spent this whole interview talking about the push and pull between you being a broadcaster and a musician and and a, and a composer and a cellist and and wanting to figure out your path. So in the in the coming years. Do you suspect you'll stay with the, the TV thing or do you think that there'll be more composition in the music realm coming from Maral Mohammadi? Whether I stay with TV or not, I, I think not for that long, only maybe a few years, but we're definitely going to have more music from me. Life is so boring without art. Hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's not worth, and without cats. Oh, Art and cats lost me are there. the two yeah. necessities. You lost of me life. with the cats. I'm a dog person, but I, you, I, I love was, dogs too. I, was with I you love animals. But, <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for this. Thank you. Please don't get a nose job. Uh, I'll, I'll feel forced to get one as well then. And I, <laughs> I won't. Um, <laughs> I don't think, I really don't think you need one. You're perfect as you are. And, Thank um, you. and uh, thanks for all the time you've given us, really. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's great. I hope one day we can, you know, just grab a cup of tea in Toronto or London. Oh, I can't wait for COVID. Talking. You know, London's my hometown. That's where I grew up, and I can't wait. Oh, yes, to, you said yes. yes. <gasps> I want. I want this God. to be over so I can come visit for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Khodafis. Khodafis, khodafis. Mar al Mohammadi. She's an Iranian-British musician, TV producer, and presenter based in London, England. Her culture program, Panjere, appears on the Iran International Network. Maral joined us from London today. team microphones are going back on reassemble there's captain reza the fabulous keon groovy shaya groovy shaya did you enjoy moral mohammadi yes actually i was ex expecting this would be an awesome interview and i really love her and actually i'm very glad that you mentioned about the situation of performers mm -hmm. in this covid uh, you know, sometimes I see people uh, don't take it seriously for musicians. Mm -hmm. It's really, mm -hmm. really hard time. Mm -hmm. Not, not 
not only financially but emotionally you know m- I, I thought with myself that my for more than a decade my calendar w- was based on my gigs yeah and it's gone you know and now it's a regular calendar and yeah. you know uh, it's really hard it's really hard and thank you f- to for yeah and not just musicians but as i said to morale performance in general yeah, dancers yes, for sure. comedians uh magicians whatever yes. yeah yeah it's it's a it's something that and, and and historically again there have been there are examples we can cite where governments you look at the french government you look at the, even the american government in the past have have stepped in and gone we need to support our arts sector yes. um for the sake of our own culture and uh, as as a way to create jobs and and help the economy and all that mm-hmm. um and and that's something that's in in dire need uh captain reza yeah uh, on that note, any live performance, theater, I mean, they've all been affected. Yes. But funny enough, uh, as Moral was talking, because before that we were talking about uh, accents and Persian accents and stuff like that, I thought Moral has been living in London like m- most of her life, and she's got a Persian with a slight American accent <laughs> and not British at all, which was interesting. I heard some British. A little bit, yeah, every now and again. But for but but uh, I found it very fascinating. Right. Yeah. And for somebody who has been living outside of Iran all her life, she really is like she's she seems like her heart is in Iran. And if she had to choose, definitely would have chose to live in Iran. Mm. It's see, it's a common denominator of our show. Yeah. You know, d- it doesn't matter how young you you leave or even if you're not born there you feel that uh, connection it's quite um amazing yeah. the fabulous keon I, uh, I, immediate reactions to yeah I, I really liked her she's not your average cookie cutter tv presenter i mean i i respect people like morale someone that doesn't try to fit into society's mold of what a person should look or act like I think that's what, what makes a person beautiful and really stand out, their uniqueness. So I And I appreciate the fact that she's uh, not a supporter of the nose job. I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, I, I, well, why, why don't poor we? Poor moral. <laughs> I mean, she brought it up, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, it's true. Which yeah. is it's funny, because when I looked at her photos, initially, I thought that she had gotten a nose job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yanni, you, you went to look for that. You were like, <laughs> no, was uh, the first like, thing I, I, like, I you're like, I was like, baby, I was in judgmental she's a unique like, oh, yeah. soul i i i you know i, I have a lot of respect uh, i mean it it deserves a hundred shows to actually <laughs> get into it but at some point we have to you know we, we're gonna have to get into the conversation of why the nose job culture you know what, plastic surgery who, who are we trying to you know be and look like and and i think i've said this story before to, to you guys but i mean you go to places in the world like well, southeast asia uh-huh. and they're envious of our of uh, yeah. you know my nose they're like oh we, and they get those surgeries done yeah. to make the nose more prominent or the, have a bigger bridge and so you know it's it's a long process of learning to love who we are and i'm no, not sure is. if that's ever gonna happen but you but, know what uh, i call a nose job for Iranians an unnecessary <laughs> epidemic I'm s- like some oh, people no. it's f- it people get it who don't need it at all I'm ex- exampling my own cousins who got like oh, they all had perfect noses no problem there and they all got it they all got noses because everybody there. else is doing yes. it there. but you can say the same about plastic surgery in the west too it's mm. it's lip it's, injections so, yeah. I I can't tell you the amount of women I know beautiful women that just effed up their face with injections. Mm. It, it breaks my heart. I don't even recognize you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, By the way, I don't. <laughs> a few months ago when we started Rook, you were key on it. Now this, this, this I, yeah. I don't do injections, <laughs> Botox, none of that. Maybe I will one day. Maybe I'll need it. Listen, but, uh, are you know. ready to get hungry? Are you ready to salivate? Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's get to our next uh, feature segment that we hear on Thursdays. He is the man. He is the, you know what? He's the captain of cuisine. He's the culinary colonel. He's the Tabrizi talisman, the Farsi foodmeister, the Turkish tradesman. It's your chef, Hos Zarer, and this is Rook Hospitality. Hi, this is your chef, Hos Zarer, and this is Rook Hospitality. Hello, Chef Haas. Hello, everybody. How are you? 
wonderful, beautiful rainy day in San Francisco, which is my favorite weather. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you Mizun? Mizun and Mizun? Yeah, well, after three miles running in the rain, I am Mizun 100%. Ah, good man. I'm glad you're still doing your running. Uh, so what are you going to teach us? Everybody's on alert here. We're all set. What are you going to teach us today uh, about today on hospitality? Well, we're going to talk about the Iranian food as a, a lens of the, the sauces and excited to talk about Fes in June, one of them. So uh -huh. we're going to dissect the dishes and talk about the if like a French cuisine, we have sauces or not. I see. So do we have sauces in Iranian cuisine? And specifically, you wanna, you're going to talk about Fes in June. So for those who do not know, what exactly is uh, Fes in June? Fes in June. A uh, fish engine just simple. There are two elements, like a uh, uh, Captain Reza knows, like a movie. You have a, a main actor and actresses. We have a walnut and pomegranate juice or the paste. That's two elements. And after that, you can flavor it with any kind of spices or vegetables. Oh, nice. and uh, by the way, it's, I think it's probably my favorite dish and one that I don't make super well. So I'm very excited to hear about this. Uh, if the, the walnut and the pomegranate are the actor and actress, uh, which one is which? Uh, depends who to who's talking. So I will go for pomegranate for actress and walnut <laughs> for the um, because pomegranate is more beautiful. <laughs> and, and Chef Haas, just just uh, parenthetically, why why is it sometimes called Fes and John and sometimes called Fes and June? Well, uh, Fes and June is the correct one. From uh, okay, we we're gonna go a little talk about what is the Fes and June comes from from northern Iran, Gilan. And in Gilaki, they call Fes in June. The Tehran is they change to Fes in June, come from the Dirne. So mm -hmm. Fes in June is the one, since you asked this question, I was going to bring it at the end, I can tell you, the word in the Gilaki, Viz means walnut, and in Jen means grounding. So then at the end of the year, Esvand, which is last month of the Iranian calendar, there's a word called Esvandegan. So this two word has been transformed, became Fes in June, come from the Viz and Espan, uh, so Fes and June. Fes period, they period, of, period June. of the period of the crushed crushed walnut. Yes, crushed walnut, and they, 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 the way they pronounce it in Gilaki, I, am, I hope I am doing justice. Fus and June, the the different. <laughs> uh, by the way, I thought it was like, you know how if you're very close to someone, you call uh -huh. them June, and uh -huh. if you're kind of arm's length, you're, I thought it was like that. Like, depending on how much you like it, you call it Fes and June. That's what oh, I thought, Oh, my too. Fes and June versus, yeah, Fes and John. Yeah. But uh, uh, this is interesting that it's it's geographic. I'll go with the Gilaki since my mom's from Tabriz. Um, Chef Haas, why is Fes and June significant? What do you know about the history of it? Well, first thing, if you look at the climate, Iran, uh, the, the pomegranate, like we talked two elements, walnut and pomegranate, they grow easily, especially pomegranate. They are resistant for the bad weather, less water. So it's one of the ancient fruit in uh, the Iran. It's actually, we can proudly tell that's a 100% Iranian fruit grown and has been exp went to another country. Uh, uh, countries. This is 100% I can tell that one. You stole Iranian. my segment, Haas. I was going to bring <laughs> that up. Well, 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 we can <laughs> still do that. We'll still do that. So you're saying pomegranate, right, is 100% is okay. Persian? Yes. Okay. And then there are more than 1,000 variety of pomegranates. It's blown mine away. And they are right. And also there's a, you can divide it by a, a, a sweet tart and sweet and tart in middles. So they are different flavors, different color, and they, like you know, the old days in Iranian, they used to, every part of the Edison they used, like in the, from the skin, they used to use as a coloring factor from the pomegranate uh, skin. And, and can you imagine there are between 200 and 1400 seeds inside the pomegranate, the wow. average? Yeah, yeah. So the, it's grown there, and it's one of the beef for, like, as you know, tomato paste has been introduced us in the past two uh, centuries. And before that, we used to do our own paste, like from the wild plums and pomegranate, barberries. And pomegranate paste was one of the molasses, was the main ingredient in the dishes. Wait a and second, wait a second. So we didn't use tomato sauce until the last time? Tomato came from Southern America, from coast of, coast of Colombia into Europe oh. in the after two, uh, but not even less than 200 years that's so interesting wow. because so many persian khoresh are tomato based now 
So that's you, you touched it to a very touch subject. That's why if some people they complain to me why you doing infusion. I am saying I'm not doing infusion. I, if you accept the 200 years ago tomato paste in our cuisine, why not accept my take on the Persian cuisine, the modern mm-hmm. cuisine? Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so I, I'm sorry if I cut you off. You keep going on the history of the fe, of Fest yeah, of June. Yeah. So the when you look, so the pomegranate walnut was there, and we have used a lot in the cuisine, and especially in northern Iran. There are lots of pomegranate variety and the walnuts especially. And also it's a perfect marriage for the game dishes like a bird and especially Caspian Sea. And they have uh, the, the, the uh, um, dogs and other birds and the perfect flavor for goes with the bird. And also to balance the flavor because the pomegranate is uh, considered as a, a garmi, like uh, we call yin yang, like Chinese uh, we call jiaoyu sami. And to balance that one, sometimes they use the honey, but since honey is sugar, they go for the squash, natural juice. Uh, so they f- balance the flavors. I have a question. We in English we don't have garmi and sardi, but in Farsi. Uh, we actually we attribute certain food to being garm and warm, f- warm or cold. And yeah. Yeah. cold. I guess we have hot meals, cold meals. What is, but we do, but no, no, no. Like you can no, have, it that confuses that's, the people. Yeah, it, because the best way to describe the American talk about yin yin yang yang. It's Chinese method: dark and bright, negative and positive, mm-hmm. which is offset each other. That, um, but it's not, again, it doesn't do justice. So that would be actually, I don't want to spoil, I am going to have a future segment about, talk about Jeremy Osarmi and Abu Avicenna. Yeah, that, that's Ab- a- Avicenna. Avicenna was a great scientist, especially when it comes to Jeremy Osarmi. So Haas, uh, now weave in what you said in the beginning. You said something about um, we don't have sauces in the same way that um, French cuisine does. So how does that uh, tie in here? That we, you would use the sauce of Fes and June for other kinds of uses? Yeah, this is the beautiful about the rock, and we're going to talk in the future. Okay, French cuisine wasn't French cuisine until like 19th, 17th, 18th, 19th century revolution and become Renaissance. So the sauces, mother, five modern sauces came French cuisine 19th century by a chef. But Iranian cuisine is, goes for ancient times. So, but the, what we have followed, we have used the dishes and like family styles, we have sauces. But it's made with the dishes. We're gonna use, make it uh, uh, narrow it down to fes and jun. When you make the fes and jun, you cook them with the protein. It used to be duck, which is the perfect marriage with the duck. But then Iranian they didn't have access that much for that, so it became a cheaper. They use a chicken. Chicken is more popular right now. But actually, support. so if you take the protein away and you use this sauce, this sauce by itself. It's vegan, you can make it, you can use for dressing, you can use for appetizers, you can use for another protein like a do- uh, the venison or the foie gras or any kind of gamey meat. Right. And also you can use as a dipping, like if I gave recipe for Super Bowl with the chicken drumlet dipping the face in June sauce. And it was one of the winner on the, the newspaper. That's amazing. It, that, it makes so much sense. It works perfectly as a sauce. Why wouldn't we? So now you have, a, you're going to explain um, your method of making this sauce. I, I, I know that I've already got a preview of the video we're putting up on um, our Rook Media website, rookmedia.com. And, and it's awesome. I mean, this time you're really showing us how you make this dish. Can you describe what people will see when they go to see the video? So what I did in the video was I chain show the basically how to make the sauce separately without any protein this sauce can be used chilled keep in the refrigerator for a few days and uh, also and even they can freeze in the ice cube uh, container so in the future they can defrost it and use it it works very well so this is the i show i'm showing in the video how to make it step by step this sauce and also I have my touches. Again, we talk about the, what is it delicious means for somebody. Delicious means your test buds. Maybe some dishes delicious for me, not for you. So that's why it becomes a word in perversion or bedah pazi. So when you know how to cook, then you can take the element out of the dish and add your flavor. Like for example, if you don't want a cardamom, don't add the cardamom this sauce. I add a cardamom, I add cinnamon, I got turmeric in it. So the point is here, 
based on your taste bud, your own right. flavor you like, you can adjust the ingredient, make it your own. You, you've said something like this before, and I really appreciate it. You've got this emancipated idea of like uh, people should do their versions of, of of cuisine, what they what they actually like to taste, because uh, Persians do tend to get quite doctrinaire, right? About like, no, this is what, and, I, and I'm sure that's the case with Fes and June, uh, that that um, some people expect it to to look a certain way. So I know there's like a, there's a, a darker version of Fes and June and a lighter version of it. And, and I'm sure people can get very territorial about that. Um, you, your credo seems to be, do what you like to taste, right? Correct. You, you got, you, this is an amazing, great, great question you, you, or subject you brought. It. For Fes and June, the most important walnut is walnut, but the, what kind of pomegranate molasses, what kind? Did you use a tart one? Do you use a sweet one? So you can adjust the flavor. If you have a molasses like a tart, you can adjust it by adding a honey or adding a squash to it, puree squash. You can adjust it to your taste buds. So that's why we are used to with the flavor of the what who made for us like our mom so that's the best fashion engine for us so when we test somebody's else we see a little tartar a little sweeter we are like ah this is not working for me but we also have to be open-minded we can train our test bots we can train it and also with the new generation and social media those old days raising hand this is not iranian this is not it's gone away it's a history right now new generation open arm accepting the revolution, I call it revolution, of the food of Iran, showing, with di- I can't use the word, um, the constructions of the food. Separate it and bring the flavor and use it for the dishes. Like for example, in here we use the uh, strawberry, raspberry, sherry vinegar for the dressing, salad dressing. Why not use the pomegranate dressing? Okay, uh-huh. what's the pomegranate dressing? That's the pomegranate sauce we make a walnut. There's walnut in the salad. But you want to have chicken salad, right, in a restaurant. Why not have a chicken salad with walnut and I lettuces and some other vegetables and drizzle with the tesinjun sauce? How hard is it to put some of this sauce in a large Tupperware container <laughs> and send it from San Francisco <laughs> to Toronto? Is that is that taxing? Is that a problem? In the uh, well, better than that, <laughs> I will I hopefully this Corona over. I will be there personally making in person oh, for you guys. Now you're and I will believe make a big me. Bag I was my home. mouth is watering watching oh. this video, um, Chef Haas. Uh, this is great. I um, I can't wait for people to see how you make this, and uh, we've got some amazing background today. Uh, another uh, excellent edition of hospitality. So. Rookmedia.com. Go to Rookmedia.com. We'll put it right on the front page there. This video of how to make Fes and June sh- uh, sauce, um, according to our, our great chef, Haas Sare. Thank you for this, brother. My pleasure. It's a pleasure always being with you guys. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Haas. Bye. That's Chef Hasare in San Francisco with hospitality. Again, see the video at Rookmedia.com. How about that? Are you hungry now? I'm starving. Yeah. Let's Pass not go to the gym and, and let's gym. just keep eating fast and Surely <laughs> that's the way to go. <laughs> the, that is full time for Rook today. Uh, I am actually hungry. The fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Ruby Shia, thank you so much for this. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist, Thoughtful Nagin. Chef Haas, Savvy Roham, the fabulous Keon, Aray Merdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Uh, we really appreciate it. Please subscribe if you've not done so already on any of our platforms and check out our support page on our website. It means everything to us. Uh, check out our patrons page there too. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Thank you again for listening. Talk to you on Monday. In the meantime, Mizun Bashi.